In this video, I'm going to be making this two-player split-screen soccer game with only code. That means no 3D models, no pictures, no animation rigs, nothing except for HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and some of this language that runs on the GPU called GLSL. We're going to start from making 2D graphics with shaders and build our way all the way up to rendering, creating, and texturing 3D shapes. With that being said, here we go. Before we start actually making the game, we're going to have to set something up so we can render graphics. I'm planning on using WebGL so our code can have access to the GPU, or a graphics processing unit. I've tried to use the CPU for 3D game rendering before, but the final product ended up a little bit resolution challenged. Uh, the main difference is that the CPU has to render each pixel one by one in a big list every frame, while the GPU can render all of them at the same time since it's physically structured differently. With WebGL set up, we can write code called GLSL, which we can compile and execute with JavaScript to draw to the screen. The code we're writing is called a fragment shader. A fragment shader takes the coordinates of a pixel as an input, and then it outputs the color the pixel should be drawn as. Uh, for example, this code determines the color of the pixel depending on whether or not the pixel is on the left side of the screen. This code does the same thing, but instead makes a circle by checking how far points are from the center of the screen. We can also use external variables called uniforms, which can be updated by JavaScript. After adding uniform variable, which stores the time, we can make the shaders change over time, like in this example where the circle changes color. And even though we only really have these couple of simple tools, uh, it turns out it's really easy to make some really cool things, like these ones that I made. Sadly, we're here to learn about 3D shaders. The main thing we have to do to go from 2D to 3D is to turn our 2D screen coordinates into 3D space coordinates. There's a couple of popular ways that 3D graphics can be done. Most of them revolve around the idea of rays and a camera. A camera in real life takes in rays of light through a lens which focuses the light to a single point called a focal point. When we represent a camera with code, however, Many 3D graphics techniques start from the camera's focal point, then they lay the computer screen in front of it and shoot one ray from the camera's focal point through each pixel on the screen. Then when a ray hits a 3D object, the code figures out what color the object is at that point and changes the color of the ray's pixel to the determined color. Uh, when we repeat this process for each pixel on the screen, we can gradually build a 2D image of our 3D object. But then we have the problem of how do we represent our 3D object or even know when a ray has intersected it. To solve this, we're going to use sine distance functions. These are equations that take an input of a point in 3D space and then return the distance to the surface of an object. The equation will return a positive value if the input point is outside the object and a negative value if the input point is inside the object. Then, we can place a camera somewhere and have it shoot out rays for each pixel towards the SDF. Each ray can take small steps until it either reaches a negative area or goes too far. When we do this with a 2D camera and a 2D sine distance function, we get a 1D image. But if we use a 3D camera with a 3D distance equation, we have a 2D image of our 3D object. We can render 2D images of any sine distance function now. How do we actually find a sine distance function? It's possible to imagine sitting down and thinking about what the equation could be for like a sphere or a box. Imagine trying to find the equation for this bunny or this ball, and all of a sudden it seems impossible. Let's start with the SDF of a circle. Starting with our input point, P, the distance to the surface of the circle is just the distance between P and the center of the circle, C, minus the radius of the circle. We can use the Pythagorean theorem to find the distance between P and C. This is actually also the exact same equation as for a sphere. We can change the center point and radius in the equation of the sphere to change its position and size in the camera's perspective. It gets a lot harder for other shapes, but fortunately, some very smart people have written articles with distance functions for lots of shapes, and ways to combine or manipulate them. One of the ways to combine objects is the minimum operation. If you have the distance equation for two different objects, you can combine them by just taking the minimum of the two equations. This works because the distance to the combined object is the same as the distance to the closer object. You can also use what's called a smooth minimum instead of a normal minimum, which gives a distance between the two objects when they're close enough, instead of just returning the true minimum. The result is the smooth blending of objects. 
You can also flip an object inside out by using a negative sign. If you take the maximum of an object and a negative object, you can intersect the two objects to create more complex shapes. Now we get to start doing the cool things. Let's start with this little circle, and then move it up here so that all our coordinates inside of it are just decimals. Now if we ignore everything except for the decimal part of our input point before plugging it into our equation, look at what happens. All of a sudden, we have infinite circles, but our computation is still just one simple equation. This translates to infinite spheres in 3D space while still being very easy for the GPU to render. We can make infinite copies of any shape using this technique. Another interesting way we can destroy the input point before plugging it in is with rotation matrices. If we rotate the input point in the xy plane by an angle corresponding to the z coordinate before plugging it into the distance equation, we can twist our objects like this. Also, coloring our 3D objects isn't going to be that hard either. Using the same if statements as with 2D shaders, we can color our different objects differently and add patterns and effects. Now if we can figure out some way to turn our 3D coordinates into 2D coordinates, it becomes even easier since we can just use 2D shaders that we've already made. We can even put SDFs on our SDFs. When we put all these tools together, we can make some really cool things. Uh, this is a demo scene that I made using the infinite repetition trick. It has these fake red lights that I made using linear gradients. Here's another demo scene I made. The cool shape in the middle is created by taking four boxes and twisting them together. And the background shape was actually just me typing random equations for like an hour, and it doesn't even work from the outside. The point is, when we put all these tools together from the first couple minutes of this video, we can make some really cool things already. Now that we have all our tools, we can actually start to work on the soccer game. Um, I started by making a box, which is eventually going to become our field. Then I inverted the box, and I intersected some goals into it. And then I made quick little placeholder spheres for the player and for the ball. Then I started to work on the game's physics. Uh, normally the hardest part of implementing game physics is adding a collision system, but it's really easy for us to detect a collision because we already know the distance between all the objects, so we can just wait until the distance is small enough and then call that a collision. We also know which way colliding objects should push each other because we can use calculus to figure out which way the distance increases the most in, and then push objects that way. Then I added a kick ability and a jump ability to the player to round out the mechanics of the game. Uh, I think that the kick and jump combine really well to let the player do some cool combos and bounce the ball off walls before scoring. Then I finally made the player. You can see it's made up of cones, spheres, and rods, and that jacket shape is an abomination of mathematics. I don't think I could make it a second time. Then I added some engravings to the ball and put some animations in the game. And although it looks pretty, I'll say, thematic right now, I thought it might work a little bit on the colors. And I started with the walls. Um, I used this cool star function from this shader by Nimitz on Shader Toy for a backup. And then after I watched this phenomenal shader tutorial by Kishimisu, I made a similar shader to what he demonstrates in the video. And I used it to make these runes that I put on the wall. I used a noise function with some fancy math to make these kind of portally looking goalposts. Next, I started to work on the floor. I used a noise function as a height map to give the floor a little bit of texture. And then I used the same pattern as for the wall as a height map and just for highlights on the floor to give it this kind of cool runic engravings. Uh, after that, I colored the player character and I gave it this little rib cage using some absolute value functions. I also colored the ball and I gave it a little bit more texture with some twisted donut shaped cutouts and I gave it some lighting. Uh, and with all the graphics of the game done, I added controller support, I made the game split screen, and then I added this quick little scoring system, and I colored the second player to be red. And that's pretty much it for the game. I want to say thank you very much for watching, and as of the time of posting this video, this channel has 11 subscribers, and it would really mean a lot to me if we could get that number to 12. Bye!